Okay, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Mark Hall, I'm AE0ME. I was originally licensed as AD0ZQ and said, you know, if I ever get into CW, I want something simpler. And uh, I noticed that the auto assignments were getting close to this call sign, so I went ahead and put in for it and got it. So I've had that since uh, 2019, I think. Mark? Yes. May I interrupt? Yes. For those of you that don't know Mark, he is known as that guy. He came into a class uh, testing session, what, four years ago, five years ago? October of 2017. 2017. Walked in at 1 o'clock with no license and walked out at 3 o'clock with an extra. So he's known as wow. that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I got into ham radio because I joined my local cert group and Kathy joined that same group and we got her to become a ham as part of that too. So nice job, thank you. Um, and in the process of doing that, um, I knew my timing was limited and I saw the schedule that uh, the class was going to be. So I had three weeks of planning. I've started practicing the test, said, yeah, I'm passing this one. Let's for kicks just try and do the next one. And so since I had three weeks and a targeted goal of I wanted to do it and I didn't want to pay for three sessions, I said, let me see if I can do that. So that's basically how I did it. Okay, um, how many here have ever heard of Arden? All right, how many of you have heard of it but don't know what it is? Okay. How many of you have an Arden node? How many of you are curious to see if you want to get a node? <laughs> so I gave a variation of this presentation to the St. Charles County uh, Emergency Communication Association. I am a member of their group. They are located in uh, St. Charles County. We meet at the Emergency Operations Center, which is uh, in O'Fallon, Missouri. Uh, just north of the T.R. Hughes, uh, actually I take that back, the Carshield Field uh, ballpark out there. Um, I, have, I have committed to getting the same presentation to their website to be able to post it there. Uh, it was 310 megabytes the last I looked at it. It's a little too big, so I've managed to trim it down to just about 55 now, which is far better, but I still got to see what I can do to clean it up a bit more. and. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you here is that the links that I list in here will be shown on the last slide. So you don't have to worry about trying to scramble uh, and write that stuff down. And like I said, we will be posting this to the w0eca.org website once I can get it to, uh, to Zach and he can do his magic. So Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network uses commercial off-the-shelf, low-cost wireless equipment to form a self-discovering linking network. I have two devices right here that are actually working right now. There is this node, which is talking to that node over there. This one is running on house power. It is connected, this one is basically just a transmitter and an ethernet line coming out. This one is the equivalent of your home router. It's running a two gigahertz uh, Wi-Fi network on it and a five gigahertz, I'm sorry, a two gigahertz mesh network, five gigahertz to be able to touch your phone, things like that. It has a link out that you can get to the internet so that way you can download patches or software or things like that to things on that network. But then it links in to these other transmitters. So the other transmitter at that end is the same one. And some of what we're going to do, I'll, I'll just kind of show you the hardware right now. This is essentially the same thing as what I've got there, but it's not as strong a, a, a transmitter. The ones that I've got off to the side there are a 16 dBi uh, transmitter. This one is a 13 dBi. And this one is 19. This is one of the sector antennas we are going to install at the 8.5 repeater site. And the radio transmitter that it uses is this. So this has a vertical and a horizontal polarized antenna. So it doesn't matter how you move, you will still get signal. And that's why you have two radio connections on this device. And then we can use this device to run power over the ethernet line. So literally the only thing running out of the building is an ethernet wire just like you would plug in your home computer. Uh, the other thing I'll point out is this node down here is running on a, a LIFE LIFE PO4 battery. Um, I've got the same arrangement down there that I have here, the transmitter and the, uh, the 
wireless uh, router node, and that's a battery pack that I put together myself. Um, I also have run this off of a DeWalt battery pack, literally overnight, and uh, it didn't even bring the battery pack down measurably. So you can do this with very, very little power, and I'll talk a little bit in just a second about the cost for this, because you can do that fairly cheaply too. Do you have the reason why we use 2.4 gigahertz? Um, the reason it's using 2.4 is it happens to have a 2 gigahertz and a 5 gigahertz radio. It's using the 5 gigahertz to get to... We have, amateur radio has spectrum within... I'm, I'm gonna, gonna go through all that. All right. Um, the other nice thing is using hardware like this, we can provide a fixed or portable internet style emergency service. So how many of you are comfortable using the internet? You will be comfortable using Arden. Arden looks just exactly like the internet, except it's all private. So we don't actually, uh, we're not accessible on the, the mesh from the internet, but and you typically can't get out to the internet from the mesh. But if we lose internet, we lose power, we lose communications, there's no cell phone, you can still do data and connect to things like an IP camera like this. Yes? Uh, do you do a domain name server or is it all IP address? It is all, uh, all set up for you, it's completely managed. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about how that works a little later on because we're gonna actually look at it here. Um, the other nice thing is it completely configures itself and that includes domain name services. It, it allocates all the internet addresses. It automatically configured the links between these two devices. Literally all I had to do tonight is plug them in. It calculates the network addresses from the hardware itself. So it should be unique and we don't have people uh, conflicting because they're all using the same address space. So you were talking about uh, frequency allocations. Um, we have four bands that can be used for Arden. There's the 900 megahertz band, and let's see here. The, the 900 megahertz band, the 2.4 gigahertz band, but the problem with the 2.4 uh, gigahertz band, these are the only two channels that hams can really use that aren't completely overwhelmed with people's home networks. So you only have two channels to cover an entire metro area. So we don't typically use 2.4 gigahertz anymore for that reason. The 3.5 gigahertz band, I'll show you uh, some other nodes around the country. They used that as a backbone, but the FCC has reclaimed half of that already and have told the users to get off of it. The other half of that frequency band is about to be reclaimed and they're advising people to get off of it. Uh, a lot of the cell carriers that are doing the uh, portable internets and stuff like that are, are chewing up bandwidth to do that kind of stuff. So the best thing we can do is basically use the 5.8 gigahertz band. As you can see, we've got a lot of channels available if we stay at a five megahertz bandwidth. Um, these are allocated for different classes, just like we do for our frequencies. And essentially, the home Wi-Fi's happen to hit this group three that I'm outlining right here. The other advantage that we have with it is hams, we get to use higher power. That combined with the much stronger uh, sector antennas makes us get a lot more connectivity with that and you can easily throw this 30 miles, maybe 40 miles. Um, not all of these frequencies are actually supported by the hardware. And I did some looking around at the uh, Arden website and all of the hardware that they list that's compatible only uses this same cluster that I'm outlining and have been talking about. So they use those frequencies. They do not go outside that. So if you buy something that Arden says they support, you will be compatible with anything else that is being deployed using Arden. So you don't have to worry about getting hardware that's gonna be on a different frequency band. So there's all kinds of stuff that you can use. And as you can see, we've got a wide variety of prices here, ranging from $29 for a device like this that uh, Brendan brought in to 
about 350 for a 34 dBi dish that also uses this radio right here. The radio itself, the new ones are about 140 or so, but you want the older ones because they've changed some of the hardware in it. So if you buy the one that's about $89, that means, you know, essentially you're looking at 250 for this antenna like we've got over there and that same radio. So that would get you 120 degree antenna covering a fairly wide range, which means you can hit more than one one site. What does 120 degree antenna mean? That means that the antenna pattern uh, is in the optimal range between these two angles. So this is 120 degrees, and if you know your peak signal is zero dB loss, then by the time you get down to three dB, you're at those 120 degrees. So you get a little bit wider, a little bit, but it starts falling off fairly rapidly after that point. Um, so the recommended hardware that they want you to use is this multiple input, multiple output, which means that it can talk to several clients at the same time. That's very, very important for throughput. Um, I talked about the general price range, uh, line of sight requirement. If you try and connect up with uh, a microwave, which is basically the band that this is in, you must be line of sight. It generally does not bend well around many obstacles. I will show you a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, with the right antenna and choose the right power, setting, you can easily go 30 miles. Uh, we've got some that we look like we'll be able to do 40 miles. Um, as I mentioned, the microwave signals are less forgiving of terrain and foliage. Um, if you have a 30 dBm transmitter, and uh, this $89 radio right here does do 30 dBm, and you use this 34 dBi or the, even the 30 dBi dish, the transmit level of your 30 dBm is about a half a watt. But by the time you do all of the gain through your antenna, you are now possibly putting out one kilowatt of affected radiated power in a very narrow band. If you're off to the side, you're more or less out of it. So just be careful and use the minimum power that you need to use. Same rules we use for everything else. Um, the chart that I've got over here is the, uh, this is the supported hardware mesh and you can find this at their uh, supported platform matrix. It is uh, linked at the top of their page as a menu item, you'll be able to find that. Uh, plus again, I'll have the links later on. But this is all of the supported hardware and this is the version of the software that you can download. And they also have links to Amazon if you want to purchase one. My word of advice, don't purchase hardware until you know it will work at your location. Remember I talked about uh, terrain being a problem. I've got at least three or four people that I cannot get an RF signal to right now. And we are working on trying to solve that. Yes? Are any of these uh, systems suitable for hand mounting inside of an attic or do they need to be outside? You really, really want to get it outside because five gigahertz doesn't like to penetrate wood terribly well. Um, as a case in point, while I was trying to rebuild all these nodes, we got about five of those uh, little ones there and the rocket that's in front of it. I hooked all of those up at home and tried to shoot one through my floor to one of my antennas underneath pointing straight up from right underneath it so that way I could get out to the internet and do all that stuff to connect up to the rest of the mesh. And it did not connect. Um, so it, it was not happy going through the floor. So I, I think the inside is probably not gonna work well. Um, so let's talk about the basic network architecture here. The general concept is we want to run a backbone. That backbone should be carrying most of the traffic longer distances. Um, one of the basic concepts is you're typically probably gonna be working with things that are closer to you. When you work at a company, you're working at stuff primarily in your company and limited 
to the internet. This is the same basic concept. Most of the services that you're gonna to wanna to access are gonna be close to you. So the expectation is most of that traffic will stay down near your end site. And then a relay node, which would be kind of a middleman. Uh, so if our field day site, we had a small mobile site and connected to a sort of a regional antenna that would then access multiple local sites and then our backbone might connect to a few like say two or three of these relay nodes so these relay nodes cover a large area the backbone links to these relay nodes would be more or less point to point and then from each of the backbones it can route everything around to mirror that same kind of connection at the other end and then you might have a uh, organization that you support like an emergency operations center that has a fixed node. So the backbone links, probably you're looking at something that should be 10 miles or more. Um, a case in point would be W0SRC, the 85 repeater, and the KD0ZEA repeater, which is going to be one of the gateways down into uh, Franklin and Gasconade counties. A regional access link would be probably less than 10 miles, and an example would be linking a backbone site to a hospital or a water tower uh, to cover a region, and then your home or field site would be a short distance. So if you were doing you know, something at your house, going to a park, wanting to do something, assert exercise, the uh, set exercise, things of those nature. The software, um, the firmware images can be downloaded from ardenmesh.org. It is free, so once you have your hardware, you just download it and install it. They have instructions on how to do it. It's not terribly difficult to do, but expect that you'll probably spend a half an hour to an hour the first time you've done it. Um, by the time I got all this straightened out the other night, I was probably doing a node in between five and 10 minutes. Um, other packages can be installed on the routers as well. With the internet, it has encryption in it, and of course, because we are hams and subject to part 97, we cannot transmit encrypted data. Now, you look at data and think, well, isn't that unreadable? But anybody that can download, store, parse an ethernet packet, which is essentially what's sent over the radio link, can decode the message. Um, if you encrypt it, then they can't, and that's the part that we have to stay compliant with. So you can install a package called Block Known Encryption that prevents encrypted things from being transmitted across the radio links. So that way it'll keep you compliant um, and then there's another thing, uh, mesh chat. If you remember instant message clients and things of that nature, it gives you a web-based way to type messages back and forth, even across the mesh, regardless what kind of distance you are. Um, what we tried doing tonight, and it failed uh, because we could not get connected to the Wi-Fi, is uh, we were going to actually VPN from that device down there to my home network and get out onto the bigger mesh. So instead, I'm going to have to show you some pre-recorded demos, and some of what I wanted to do just won't happen. Um, Mark, yes. Uh, I don't know how much power you need from the Wi-Fi. Can you use a hotspot on a, rig on a phone for it, or would that be too weak? I don't think I can connect to it, but I don't know if, uh, what it would take for you to hook, hook yours up. If you want to play with it, um, I, th yeah. I would need to uh, probably, we would probably need to pull it over here to get an, an Ethernet. Actually, yeah. Um, we'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll figure something out. Um, Oh no, we can use this wire right here that would get over to it. So that one's one we can pull. Uh, but the idea being, if you do not have a radio connection, you can plug in the router like this and do an encrypted connection across the internet, which keeps it isolated from the internet to connect to the other end, and it behaves like a virtual radio frequency link. So the four or five people I said that we don't have a radio link that will work for them, they can VPN connect. We have, as uh, an organ, I'll call it an organization, a group, um, have been using VPN to connect through everything and we're connected to the East Coast via a VPN link from my house, uh, which gets us onto the bigger mesh. 
It also lets us participate in something called mesh phone. So we have seven digit dialing around the country. The first three digits are the area codes, so 314 and 636, and the last four digits are extension numbers that we assign. Um, advertised services can be accessed from anywhere on the mesh. In order to have something operate, we have to advertise or make that name available and give you a link so that you can find it. Uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. A weird issue, those little uh, nano station locos, this is the only one I've seen this wish, um, it, it when it, I tried to download the image that it said to use, it did not come up. I could not connect to it on the ethernet, I couldn't connect to it on the radio setting, because those things don't work until after you put in your call sign. So I couldn't get in it to it to put in the call sign. And what I found out with a couple hours of research is that if you install the rocket engine on a nanostation loco, then it will work for you. So if you end up buying that loco, it's not going to work the way they describe it initially. Um, so when we do it, this is kind of what the basic page setup page looks for. Okay. Um, we'll plug this one in over there. Oh crap, I think I need it at the other end now that I think about it. Because that's the... Down there? Yeah. Okay. If you can do that. Um, you'll need this wire and it will plug into port one on the router. So, oh, you got a wire? Okay, awesome. Whoops. Sorry about that for those of you listening. Oh, no, just connector. All right, good. <laughs> As the, uh, the thing goes, when you have things that don't exactly work the way you think they do, this is the learning part later that Cliff talks about. <laughs> it depends. It depends. But you learn the basics and then as you go do the exercise, you learn more later. So this is the basic setup page that you'll do. The first thing you have to do is basically plug in, uh, after you flash it, you will plug in your call sign and give it a node name. Um, it should always start with your call sign. Um, rec we recommend that it describes the type and direction for access or backbone nodes. So here, this is my home system. I've got multiple of these little routers. So I basically put the last four of its serial number on there so I can look at the box and tell them apart. Um, you have to set a root password for it. And then here's where it automatically allocates address space and I can choose a few settings. Um, Pick the land size, and they have options that go from 1, 5, 13, or 29 hosts that you can put on the network. Um, if you change that, your address is all changed. So I wouldn't hard code IP addresses on anything if you don't have to. The nice thing is it lets you allocate um, a static IP for it in its address space. If you change the address space and you had it as the first IP or the third IP or the fifth or whatever, it's still the first, third, or fifth after it changes the address space. Um, at that point, you can enable the local Wi-Fi, so this would be on the router a five gigahertz for me to connect up with my phone. Uh, turn on the mesh RF so that way if two of those routers were in physical proximity um, that the Wi-Fi signal can go, then they will connect up. They don't have to have this extra transmitter. I just use the extra transmitter just to show, yes, we can do a Wi-Fi signal like we would put on the side of a building. Uh, configure the minimum transmit power that you need. Uh, it has a couple ways to do that. The transmit power, depending on your device, may go from as little as 2 dBm to as high as 30. And the other thing it will do is it will give you the option to pick a distance um, in terms of thousands of meters. And then if you once you click apply, it will ch save the setting for power that it's going to use. Now they've changed some things in the Arden firmware, so it doesn't mean you're locked at that, it's going to adjust that power level up and down as it needs to try and get a good signal. Okay, um, let's do a real quick check and see if we, our VPN is connected. Whoops. It is. Cool. 
All right. Thank you very much, Brandon. That's very, very helpful. Good idea, whoever tried that out. Um, we recommend that you also configure the location. Um, down here, you have your latitude and longitude, and you can click a button here to upload data to the Arden servers. They have a map that shows where all the Arden nodes that have uh, locations are, and it's also going to display it at the top of the page over the node name, and we'll see that in a bit. And then I also recommend a description here telling some other things, including how to get in touch with you, because if somebody across the mesh is having a problem with something on your network, um, then they can at least come to you and get in touch with you. So I talked, yes? Mark, this is off the subject, but does your pointer have a mouse function? Because on this screen, we can't really see what you're pointing to. Um, I understand it's, I, I don't have a good way to do it, and the mouse, okay. the actual mouse is a little tricky, which just dropped on the form. Yeah, I, I wish it, it, this one doesn't. Um, so what you'll see here on the right side, you'll see a DHCP address reservations. And this is where I can tell it the hardware address of a device and a drop down that lets me pick an IP address to use. And then I give it a host name. And then um, this would be the services that I advertise out to the rest of the mesh. When I advertise something, it shows up here as a link if I have link checked. If I don't have link checked, it's a text message that gets displayed on the page. And then down here is where I can specify port forwarding just like you would do on a home router to get into it. Um, and then here are my neighbors. So Kyle Krieg is one. Um, I can't think of uh, half the names of, of some of the other ones here. I know Jeff is one of my neighbors. Um, on there. Oh, you are? Oh, uh, yeah, okay. Apologies, but I use you as an, as an example in this slide. Uh, not in a bad way. Good. Um, Could easily be something wrong. Oh, no, it's, it's not. Um, but as you get away from your neighbors and things farther away, this shows neighbors, like this is the guy on the East Coast that I'm linked to and the services that are available at his site. Um, so things of that nature, um, we have a link cost that has to do with how expensive the time is to get there. Um, and so you can put a bunch of different services such as web pages. Uh, there's, you can do a map for the phones and this shows the locations of, of the local phone switches that are in the state of Missouri. Uh, you can run live cameras on it. This is not live. This would be um, a mesh, mesh chat page, phone lists, and other documentation. Hey Mark, I got a green, I think this will be more visible here. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind. Not a bit. And uh, I'll use the yeah, other hand to... button hard, though. Not a problem. Yep, okay. I see what you mean. Okay. Um, so then, this is the VPN setup, and what you do is you basically set up um, where my IP address or host name is. I've got a static IP, so I can serve that. And then this is where you say the clients. This name has to match the node name that shows up at the top of my system. So where I initially put in my node name, their node name has to match exactly. Otherwise, it can't match up the client. And then you have a password, which I have conveniently uh, blocked out here. And then Art Lewis, this would be his connection. And so then from a client side, I connect to uh, Kyle to reach the rest of the St. Louis VPN session. And he has to, this is his IP address or host name, but he has to have all of my stuff defined as my node name exactly. Um, so for planning, Google Earth is a really cool thing but it's awful for link analysis. Um, it does not truly understand terrain, and it certainly does not understand radio frequency propagation. Uh, it is excellent at providing heights to things, especially if it has the 3D buildings uh, available. There are parts of St. Louis that has this and parts that it doesn't, so it's limited usefulness with respect to that. It is great for panning and zooming around sites. We will demonstrate that later. 
uh, for link analysis between any two sites, let's say you wanted to, to figure out how good a signal or what kind of power you'd have to run between the 8.5 repeater in your house, this particular link is a great site. It will plug in your location, your height of your antenna, other information you'll fill out about it, and it will figure out can you physically make a connection between those two sites. However, when you want to do a mesh like this, having to go fill that form out and save pictures to be able to look at for every individual pair of things. I'll, I'll preview a little bit. We've got 99 different nodes and locations that I'm looking at. I don't want to have to do every one of those combinations. So I downloaded the actual software they're using behind it. This is a pain in the butt to set up. I don't recommend it. Um, unless you really, really have a lot that you're gonna do with it. But it is really good software and we'll actually go in and take a look at that. If you have latitude, longitude for your link unit locations, the altitude, the antenna type, the direction the antenna is facing, uh, all that kind of stuff on both ends of each link, then it will show you what kind of link quality you will get. The Fresnel path also accounts for single bend around obstacles, and I'll show you what the Fresnel path looks like in just a little bit. Um, it is, like I said, complicated to set up and learn, but it is very effective for link analysis and prediction. To participate in our Arden discussions in the St. Louis area, we have another groups.io, which is this groups.io, G for groups, S-T-L-A-R-E-D-N. So Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. All right, so the St. Louis Arden Group is operating a mesh using VPNs and it's connected to New Jersey and we have another uh, chunk of the segment in Kansas City. We are working at building out uh, radio frequency access and a backbone. We're planning on using the five gigahertz band for that because we have frequencies to be able to point different directions if we need to and keep things somewhat isolated so everybody doesn't flood every segment. Google Earth showed potential mount locations for use in radio mobile to determine if sites are workable or not. So every person that has given me their call sign in the Arden group that is looking to hook up, I went and searched at their home location as listed in QRZ to be able to go figure out, here's the, probably the best place for you to put it so that it will hit where you want it to go. With that, 19 of the 24 St. Louis user sites, and I mean hams and home locations, um, have workable RF paths to our 11 backbone sites, and it ranges from Owensville, Missouri, to Freeburg, Illinois, to O'Fallon, Missouri. Uh, five of them have no radio frequency path without additional access sites, which means we have to have other sites that don't belong to the club, or people that are part of the Arden group. Um, Franklin County site has physically started building theirs out. Um, their only path to get up to the St. Louis metro area is through the KD0ZEA site on top of a fairly large hill. Uh, we are planning installs at the 146.85 site on Olive and ideally some other backfill at the 146.91 at the Edward Jones facility. Um, we, the 8.5 site has hardware with that kind of a sector antenna that can reach St. Charles, Franklin, and St. Clair County locations without having to go to a dish. Uh, if the logistics work out, uh, I'm still trying to work on that. I need to get some stuff to Brandon and we have to physically go there. We will need some help if we can do this. So if you would be willing to help us literally haul a little bit of piping up Seven eight stories. flights of stairs, um, uh, seventh floor to then eight. penthouse, so it's eight. Um, we would really appreciate some help with that. We only need probably about four or five people to be able to get that up. Uh, but we're hoping to be able to mount that antenna if time allows before field day so that we can actually do a live demo and get out to the mesh. Um, we have a couple of suggestions about getting to St. Charles County. We're still working on this. We looked at one repeater site and they've got a paying customer which is Whisper, WSPR. Um, that is a primarily a uh, signal reception analysis site, but apparently they also transmit and have caused some problems to people and they wanna make sure that we don't transmit and bother them and they don't transmit and bother us. So we're 
looking at maybe trying to use WB0 HSI uh, to be able to cover almost the entire county. The only person that doesn't cover is Zach. But Zach has line of sight to the 8.5 repeater, which nobody else in St. Charles County has. So Zach is still good. <laughs> in fact, he might get better signal than some of us. Um, we estimate that to do one of those antenna combinations, which I said was about 250, give or take, you're looking at probably about 750 just in Arden node hardware. And you have ethernet and conduit and power and all that fun stuff to deal with. But, you know, then you also, if you're in St. Charles County, have to pay somebody to climb the water tower because that's county owned. Um, so we're you know, trying to figure some of that out. That's part of why that hasn't been built out. Um, one of the other advantages, if you've heard of the hospital amateur radio network, that requires our amateurs to go in and physically talk on radios between the hospitals in the event they lose communication, which means you're somewhat limited by the number of amateurs that are available, the time of day that they're available. Uh, if you needed to communicate between hospitals and you don't have uh, connect or communication any other way. But with this, in theory, depending on the legality of it, which we are still looking into, you might be able to provide some services between the hospitals with the amateur using the data side of this as the control operator. Um, so that combination where I've got that uh, router, the the transmitter and that router, um, it's under $200, even if they went with um, something closer to that. They would need a pro proxy server, cheap hardware, and we're still evaluating what kind of restrictions. So in order for these things to work, you need 10 decibels or more above the re receive threshold of these radios to account for signal fade, which is weather, leaves blowing in and out of your path, stuff like that. Otherwise, you will not have a reliable connection. Um, obviously, you'll wanna get more than that because certain things require a higher signal strength in order to get higher bandwidth. Uh, so this is a minimum, and we're looking for most of these devices, their minimum is on the order of like minus 97 dBm. Uh, sector antennas, like I said, range from you know 16 to 19 dBi. With that other small one, it's 13, but I don't really consider it a sector. These two smaller ones that I mentioned, it's only about a 45 degree beam width. But that sector antenna gives me 120 degrees, so it gives you a whole lot more flexibility, but that's a bigger antenna that you have to mount. Uh, the Fresnel path size is radically different based on frequency. Uh, if you can get to a repeater on two meter, doesn't mean you can do it on microwave. I know we were talking about getting to KD0ZEA as packet on two meter, but when you go microwave, and I'll show you why, it's not gonna go. Um, and this is exactly it right here. These circles around here are the Fresnel path. This line is the line of sight between the two transmitters. And then this is the line of sight, or the, I'm sorry, the amount of signal bend that would have to happen, the path, for it to get around your terrain. So this is his sight at home. Notice it tells exactly where you're at too. Um, and then this is that KD0ZEA repeater. And you'll see anything in green means you've got a good strong signal. Anything in yellow means not so good, it's gonna be cutting in and out. And red means you do not have a stable signal. Um, so if you stay within these white boundaries, you will connect. Now what's important is noticing the frequency that's set up down here. That happens to be the two meter range. And we show we're using that Rocket M5 just like you know the, the sectors we're putting up on, on the 8.5 repeater. Um, and I'm just using that at both ends just because it's simpler and I didn't want to start getting into, all right, well now you're using different hardware. So this is an apples to apples comparison as we change things. Um, and this is where I said your transmit power is about a half a watt, but by the time you gain 19 dB, and remember every 10 dB is 100 times stronger, um, at that point you are, are fairly significant power going out there. So you're using 35 watts radiated effectively. Uh, by the time you get away from your antenna loss, you're effectively doing 21. So, side by side, 
This is microwave. That's our five gigahertz. You notice that the Fresnel path is much, much narrower to the point it doesn't even clear that. And the deflection point that you would have still has to get up to avoid this point and these points to get over there. And at that point, you're outside the Fresnel path. So unfortunately, you're not gonna get a five gig connection to them from there. But I think we got something else that'll work for you. Um, and these are the frequencies that when I talked earlier about it matching the uh, uh, hardware for the Arden mesh, that's why I plugged those in there. So that shows the range. And I believe, but I, I'm not 100% sure on this, I'm still learning some of this. The inner one I think is your higher frequency and the outer one is your lower frequency of the band. And then the center one I think is the center frequency of the band range that you gave it there. So, I mean, I'm happy to run this for, for you based on your home location to tell for the best probable angle and terrain to get you a connection. Uh, so it, it's gonna take some planning, uh, which is why I say, don't go buy hardware until we know this works for you. All right, so current state. Remember where I said it uploads stuff? This is all the Arden nodes that have been uh, posted up to Arden's site. You notice there's a whole pile of them on the East Coast. There's a lot of people on the West Coast, Hawaii nodes. When you start getting outside of the continental US, you start getting kind of rare. How about Europe? We got a few of them. Not much when you get outside of Europe. The California mesh, this is an actual uh, site mesh. Um, what they've done here, and you'll see down here, these blue ones are the three gigahertz backbone nodes. They put those on top of a mountain, so that way they have line of sight down into all the valleys on either side. And so what they've also done is they've put a bunch of cameras like this pointing different directions. And the purpose of that is so they can watch for wildfires. And so you can watch that camera anywhere on that mesh. And so you'll find down here in the LA basin, there's a lot of people that have gone to the five gigahertz because of congestion of RF. Everybody and their brother on a two, two gigahertz node, which is these purple ones, um, you're just gonna get a lot of interference and it'll be very difficult to get the kind of distances you needed to get to the access points. So these green lines are your radio frequency links between things and uh, those are uh, decent. These gray ones are a VPN connection, so they are using the internet to make that link. So it's useful to a point until you lose all your internet. Um, LA uh, kind of zoomed in more, you can see there's a whole bunch of radio frequency stuff going across. And like I said, a lot of VPN stuff. So the purples are the 2.4, the, again the 5 gigahertz, and then you've got your backbones which are ter fairly typically high. Um, San Francisco, they've got a whole bunch of radio frequency going across the bay. Um, Phoenix, only a few nodes, but uh, they're doing a lot of radio frequency. And you'll notice that the more yellow that gets, um, at that point, it becomes a higher cost connection. So that uh, yellow one is a slower connection. Oregon, uh, they've got quite a bit going on with that too. Again, a whole bunch of VPN work going on, but you've got some, uh, you know, and this is the entire height of the state. So they're pretty spread out. Uh, our segment, the Northeast, we've got, uh, this is the guy in uh, New Jersey that's, that's got our site. Um, and then they've got a few other people. Strangely, these two guys have a radio frequency connection, but nobody's connected to them on the mesh. And then this is Missouri, which is other than one node way up there somewhere, um, that's everybody else except for one guy in the Netherlands. And with the connection now, we might actually be able to connect to him and make a phone call if time works out. Um, so these guys are all uh, starting to build out, or I'm sorry, they, they're doing some stuff with, with radio frequency. These guys down here are starting to build out radio frequency and they, they have them physically built, they're gonna go physically install them. Uh, Kansas City, that's a little bit closer view. Uh, they're, they're mostly 2.4 gigahertz. 
and that's because they're using most of these routers. And so that's what shows the 2.4 gigahertz as the mesh frequency. Um, and then in St. Louis, you know, this doesn't show many because these are the ones that are only connected now. But I'm gonna show you future planning. So this is all of the 99 sites marked in the St. Louis region. Some of these, uh, actually almost everything in this is our our local area. There are 11 backbone nodes, there are 44 user nodes, of which 24 of them are in St. Louis, and 44 hospital nodes. So a green connection here is a good link. Red is bad. And Radio Mobile says for all of these things trying to connect to each other, trying to talk to all of them, that's why we get all that red, because there's terrain in the way, and so it's blocking it. This map is 95 kilometers tall, 155 kilometers across. If you try driving this, that's probably gonna be hour and a half, two hours, give or take. So, you know, getting good radio signals for a distance is big. So if we take out all the bad connections, so I just didn't let it display them anymore, you'll see green links like this are good. The ones that have black on it means that it's a little bit weaker and it's bordering on marginal. And the yellow ones mean it's not going to be reliable. Uh, you will get intermittent connections. Yes? So if you happen to have a person with an exceptionally high location, mm -hmm. that would be very good for, yep. as for one of your uh, backbone points. Yep. Because many, many years ago during the uh, multi-point distribution days. I climbed a guy's chimney down in Imperial and you could see downtown Clayton and did 2.15 two, uh, gig with a four foot dish easy. That's one of the reasons the 8.5 site is really great because I've been up there and looked and I mean, you, it seems like you can see everything. There is nothing that looks higher, at least where it is. Um, where I talked about not being able to physically get a connection, here are the five that I cannot get a link to without using somebody else's site. Now the good news is, Mercy Washington sounds like they are absolutely on board. So that solves these three right there. Um, unfortunately, I think that's you, Jeff, isn't it? You got me with no, a link somehow. No, sorry, your, your CTR, yeah. yeah. Uh, I did a little bit more analysis and I think if we get you high enough, it'll work. Um, but this individual is not gonna be able to get to it. I'm sorry? They got me up there. Yes, yeah. yep. Uh, once, if we get something there, yes, you'll have line of sight. Gotta get it built first. Um, the problem we have here is their only path out is a hospital that is close to them, but it's high enough to get them over the rest of the terrain. And so that hospital can see all of this. And what you see here, this is, well, we've got a lot of other stuff besides the backbone. I'll, I'll cover the backbone here in just a second. Um, if we look at just the hospital networks and backbone, assuming all the hospitals want to participate, um, there's a whole lot of connectivity that goes on there, which means you've got a lot of redundant paths. If we add in the ham users, you see there's not lots of shift in that. Harn would be most of that connection. So if we go out to St. Charles and we look at the WB0HSI site, um, it looks very much the same as if we did that. Our EOC is only 80 feet above ground as far as the tower we can use. So that really doesn't buy us great connectivity most places, but at least between these two sites and the 91 and 85 repeater sites, we have at least three paths that gets us down there if we put on both of those. Which HSI sites? Um, sorry, this would be the one at 70 uh, just west of K. Okay, yeah. O'Fallon. Yeah, O'Fallon. Yes, O'Fallon. Now, haven't completely talked to them, but you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out how to make it work right now. Um, if we go KO0A, uh, past about here, not much connects. Um, 
that's a good connection, but these don't very well. Um, the proposed backbone that we're using, they've got several uh, 50 meter towers uh, that they're using down here for fidelity. Uh, the repeater site down here has good connectivity. Their EOC is on the order of 50 meters. This KD0ZEA site is really high. They they have good line of sight to both the, uh, I'm sorry, to the 8.5 repeater. They do not have good line of sight to the 9.1. It would be marginal. Yes? At Winterfest, we had a guy came up to the table uh, looking at some of the equipment we had, and he was telling us he's gotten permission from the FCC to put up a repeater in Wentzville. Okay. So I don't know if that's going to be something that could work into that too and help out. It could, but it's another set of hardware to do. And if we can, if we could install on HSI, we can cover the entire county except for Zach. Um, which is why I think that's a better solution because, I mean, we can get by covering 360 degrees once instead of having to go farther out. Um, so I, I showed you the multiple links here. There's one water tower out in the Freeburg area that um, they have two users right now that are, are potentially gonna connect. And that amazingly has line of sight to the 9.1 and the 8.5. So that gets us spread pretty well, primarily using the 8.5 site and the 9.1 is kind of a, a fill in. Um, so those are all the sites. Um, all of this basically just used as sector antennas. So that would be, you know, the hospitals that are marked, the hams that want to uh, participate so far. You'll see a lot of yellow dashed lines, which means those are not good connections. And most of those try to go back over to St. Louis. But uh, I don't have good coverage. The EOC doesn't have good coverage to certain areas. But if we fill in with a couple of the hospitals uh, as well, we get lots of good coverage. St. Louis County, we get kind of the same sort of a thing. Um, if I stick with basically, yeah, there was, there were some linkage problems there. Um, these are the, the sites that I can't get RF links to. Um, but. I mean, you know, lots of wide coverage that gets you all the way down over to the east side, multiple places, lots of hospital interlinks. They've got a pretty reliable uh, mesh possibility. Uh, when we go down to Franklin, Gasconade counties, like I said, we've got the three fidelity sites. The only way to get over to Mercy is maybe a dish at zero beaters and a dish at uh, Fidelity Gerald, and they have to have a dish also to connect back. So putting sector antennas is not going to provide coverage uh, for uh, Mercy, yeah, Mercy in Washington. Um, they have to have a dish. The guy that's coordinating in Franklin County is that guy there. His only path is back from Mercy. Otherwise, he's got to stay VPN. And then we had three or four other people that joined in and their only line of sight is to get to Mercy as well. Um, the, on, the drawback for them is there is no path anywhere else because of terrain except through the uh, KD0ZEA website, or uh, repeater site, website. What am I thinking? Um, so that's kind of the, the longer term plan of what we're looking at. Um, one of the things that I wanted to be able to demonstrate, if I can f get this hooked up and let it sync back up, uh, that one is that connection, is that spare, that'll work. All right, I just need to get the phone to register. So that way we can actually place a phone call. And, yes, all right, power. Hopefully this will register in the next couple of minutes. So I described a little bit earlier how we have the, um, the portable uh, router and then we've got a radio frequency link across the room to the other portable router and then the internet device router that Brendan put over there is going to let us connect out through the Wi-Fi. And that will give us our VPN connection back to my shack at home. 
where I happen to have two Raspberry Pis. One is running as a phone switch, one is running as a web server and some other stuff as well as the camera stuff. Um, that's taking longer to boot than I expected, um, unless it got its config and it's rebooting again. Um, so a couple of the things that we can do is I want to flip out and, oh, I wanted to show the Google stuff real quick. And for that, I need to get off the presentation. All right, let's try this. Oh, come on. All right, there we go. And this will take just a second for it to sync back up. All these smart uh, display connections, they have to talk back and forth before they'll show stuff. Because we did this just a little while ago when we flipped back to my system from the other one and that, that took some time. That's gonna be a real short demo if that doesn't uh, All right, come on, let's just power that off and restart that adapter. This is always, always the problem with a live demo. You've got uh, something that will go wrong. Remember, Murphy was an optimist. Yes? When you said you need a, a real good path for high bandwidth, is this your uh, typical modulation index kind of problem that, that you've got to have? If you're trying to get a lot of, of, of data through, say, like uh, 1080p video? Um, what, it, what it really is, is it effectively becomes a signal to noise problem. Yeah. So when you're dealing with these types of devices, it's trying to do a, uh, a multi-frequency, multiple encoding, simultaneous stream. Uh, between any two nodes. It's and parallel all the data. Exactly. So you've got at least four different paths that are using, I think it's a QAM encryption. Zach knows exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and so the stronger your signal, the more data it can pack on that signal and successfully decode at the other end. Yeah. Uh, so I imagine it has uh, forward air correction. Yes. And, and your ratio of of error correction to, you know, frames is going to give you a limitation somewhere along the line. If you <laughs> yep. I'm really perplexed at why I don't have, uh, have video. So let me try just whacking my network connection to it and just see if resetting that will do it. I, I pulled that. That's All right, so I just plugged that in again. And this just did its resize thing. So hopefully we'll get, there we go. All right, ah, I see part of the problem. It decided to extend the desktop, which I don't want done. And where, where is that? Do not extend those displays, duplicate. All right, now I can show you stuff. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so Google Earth, I basically put all the sites that were in there and the nice thing is we can sort of fly over the terrain. This is one of the things that Google Earth is great at. So what you'll see here on this diagram is these uh, light blue links are our backbone. Green links are going to be the links that you would use um, for a ham, and this one is actually the wrong color, but uh, that would be for hams going to uh, other connections. And I don't think everything is displaying. So let's go to places and make sure all those links are up. Yep, all right, just looks funky. Um, and so what I've done is home antennas have this little uh, triangle thing, hospitals are H, and as you can see, we've got a whole bunch of hospitals down in this area. I didn't put all of those on here, but um, 
most of the major links that you can see out. The pinks are hospital to hospital links. And then an orange link, which I have one down here, that goes from somebody's house to a hospital. So that is a site that has to have an additional location. Um, so the beauty part is, like I said, uh, from this repeater, all of this uh, would segment away from us, but they can all work. It is possible that we might be able to get a link from this repeater to BJC Progress West in O'Fallon as getting an alternate path down to KD0ZEA in the event the 8.5 dropped off for some reason. So that would, that would help them out. Um, one of the great sites, if we could get it, and we haven't, we haven't talked about this to anybody, I'm just looking at hospital sites that are really high. Uh, the VA site, I can get to almost every hospital in this region from that site. That is such a tall building. Um, so it, it does some amazing stuff. We got a guy up here that his only path is to get in through uh, one of the Alton sites. Yep. Which VA site are you talking about? Downtown. The Cochrane building? Or, I don't. Or the Continental building? I don't know. The one on Olive? I don't know. Oh. Um, yeah, they've also got stuff in the, the uh, what's nicknamed the Superman building, the Continental Life building. Okay. I mean, like I said, it's, it's at this point just trying to say, what could we do? Um, you know, how good could we make this if they even want to participate? So that's some of what this is about. Um, you'll see a lot of orange links here where we, well, crap. <laughs> I don't know how to, well, yeah, I guess I can get that back. Where's the, uh, make that back north again. Um, but some of these you're not gonna get a great connection to um, unless you go through some of the hospital sites. Like I said, I didn't put all of these out here, but 8.5 um, can get to almost everybody in, in, in the county, almost. Uh, if we go look over in the southeast, uh, that's the three guys I was talking, or two guys and their water tower I was talking about. Uh, we've got lots of hospitals that can bounce them around back over there, uh, you know, almost straight line shots. But most of these can still get to the 8.5 repeater, even from over here, not everything. So just kind of wanted to give you a kind of a fly overview of some of this, because that can be kind of cool. Um, so let's take a look at some of the things that uh, you can do with this. So I recorded a video from the back of a guy's house. It's on cam. Yep. <laughs> it was raining. You can clearly see it. You can see the rain dropping down, especially down on that bottom right corner some. Um, it's a little weak to see here because of the projection, but I was watching this and it, I mean, it was amazing just how much you could see through that. And you're still getting, you know, I don't know, five frames a second out of it, which is, is pretty good. Um, Where is he located? I don't know. Uh, I haven't gone to look at his QRZ page. Hello. Stop. Oh, this is there, all right. Um, I don't want that to stay open. Uh, an example, and this one takes a minute, if you basically go to this site on the mesh, they're doing what's called a reverse proxy so that they can get out to a site that they have on the public internet. So this gets you to the Franklin County EOC's website, but because we're going through VPNs, through the mesh, and then going through their reverse proxy and then going out to the internet to that website, and that traffic has to come back all the way through, this is what their page looks like. That's a WordPress site. We're still waiting on the cascading style sheet look and feel to come down and it timed out. So depending on what you do, I mean, you know, you can put something out there that gets you to the public internet, no problem. What is the reverse proxy? It's instead of uh, a proxy that you would go 
out of a company and get somewhere, it's going from the public company into a specific site that they've got protected. So in this particular case, you're going off of one network onto another using that proxy to bridge that, that connection. Because from the mesh, you can't get to the internet and vice versa. That can technically run either direction, but, all right, and, This is something that's running, I think that's on your server, um, the Pioware. So at the time I recorded this, this was live air traffic that was over the St. Louis region. So one of the fun things here is it lists all the call signs. They use a system called ADS-B to transmit which direction they're heading, their altitude, their speed, and it sends out like 10 packets or so every three seconds, and by clicking a button, this shows you the path they have been flying. And then if you put your cursor over a given aircraft, it shows you their call sign, their altitude, their speed, all that kind of stuff. And so that's a system that those aircraft use to talk back to air traffic controllers uh, with some of their data besides just radar, and it lets the airplanes talk to each other as well to help with collision avoidance. So the fact that you can basically put a software-defined radio to go listen to all that and then serve it up on a web page like this, there's several of these scattered around the mesh, um, but it'll at least let you see see some interesting stuff. There's also a system for that for um, a bars tracker too. Um, I'm going to do one last thing with the demos. Um, I don't unfortunately have the audio plugged in, but somebody has Newsline. So you, you probably can't hear it. And it should be starting any second. Yeah, I don't hear it either. I think it stole the, the audio out on the, the docking station. So, oh well, so much for that. That's a, an old news line anyway. It was from February. But it's still kind of cool to have. Uh, let me close this down and let's go to... This is the mesh. And so... One of the nice things is there is a name that you can use that will always get you to your nearest mesh. Localnode.local.mesh. And every one of these devices serves that DNS name to its local area network. So I don't care where you're at, that will get you to your nearest access point. And from that, it brings you to one of the pages. I actually am going to a different page here, but um, the initial page gives you a link to go straight here. And so this is exactly what I was talking about. So let's do a quick uh, example of mesh chat. And I just open a new tab. And so it wants you to type in your call sign. So I'm just gonna type in AE0ME. Don't use the funky zero, it doesn't like that. Um, and so this is what you can do. This is where you'll type in your message, click Ascend, and it shows you who all you've seen on the, uh, the distribution of all this. So I'm at this point going to say, hello, SLSRC. And I click Send. Page reloads, and you see the message down below. Now the nice thing is, any mesh chat, excuse me, any mesh chat that uses the same um, key, so to speak, will replicate those messages between them. So if I'm running mesh chat over here and a mesh chat over there and somebody's running a mesh chat over here and we're all on the same mesh, they can communicate. So that message will get distributed within about three or four seconds. And so they can then type back to me and come back. Um, so that's kind of a neat thing. And where I said that uh, this is my neighbor, this is cool here. Um, I think I can zoom in a little bit. 
you'll see here it shows LQ and NLQ. That's the link quality, in other words, how reliable that connection has been. And then the NLQ is how reliable my neighbor thinks the connection has been. So it looks, it's supposed to broadcast a connection to its neighbor every so often. And it counts how many of those it's seen and how many it's missed. And that's how it calculates that. And if you're going wireless, so this is a wired connection between these two devices. And so if I click on this link, that now takes me to this device that's transmitting over there. And this is that main page that just going to local node.local.mesh will take you to. And if I pull up the status page again, this shows we're getting 72 megabits between this transmitter and that one. So this is a pretty good connection, um, pretty darn fast. And then if I go over to that node and go to its status page, so I'm just going to each successive thing and looking to see what are you telling me your neighbors are. This is how you browse the mesh. And so at this point, port two is my portable router at that end. So I click on that and go to the mesh status. And here's my home network. So we're now on my home router. Yes? You said uh, 72 megabits was a pretty good connection. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the typical max out of a gigabit LAN? I don't know, because it, this isn't gigabit stuff. Uh, I know, but OK. Uh, 100. Uh, it's probably 100 megabit. Yeah. And if you're using actual wired ethernet, there's a limit of about 60% utilization, so you're doing pretty good if you get 60 megabit per second across it. Um, and I'm sorry, I said megabytes per second. This is 72 megabits per second, so you're gonna transfer about seven megabytes across that connection, give or take. Um, so in theory, the maximum for this is 150. Um, for the, the wireless, but that depends on several factors, your receive and transmit powers, all that kind of stuff. I've got these down to the absolute lowest signal level just because I don't want to fry anybody. Um, and I've, I've had three or four of these sitting in my basement shining across, you know, my desk is right here, they're pointing this way and, you know, it's been running for several weeks like that. Um, another example of the Metro, or the, uh, the, the chat is like this one. Um, Motion Eye will let me go in and uh, I can actually show some cameras. None of them are any good at the moment because it's right here. Whoops. But it will let you basically put multiple of these on a system. And if you go to a specific port number, you can load a specific camera only. So these cameras by themselves don't show up on web pages, but an application like this can take that data and serve it out in a format and stream that will work on a web page. So you can link to a specific camera or load just one specific camera. And that way your cameras can be distributed and you've got one system that makes it available. Um, where I showed some of those graphs, um, this mesh map. This is where it goes and it looks at the location data that I put at the top of my nodes. And so it will generate a map for it. And I don't know if this is gonna work because I'm on the mesh and can't get out to get the, uh, um, the background images for it. But if I could download that, it would show me all of the, uh, well, it says waiting. I don't know. Um, but the diagrams that I showed you earlier was mesh map, so that's that application. But this is a guy over in Kansas City that's hosting that, so I was able to go take a look. Um, let's see, there's, there's a, some other cool things on this as well. If you, um, charts. This page will take a minute to come up, but uh, 
This is figuring out that signal to noise ratio that it has. It doesn't have another radio near it right now, so it's by definition zero. Um, so the other thing that I'm gonna do right now is close that out and let's come back to this. And the, these two pages have links on it. If you have your smartphone and want to hook up to, oh good, I've got phone numbers. Um, so I'll, I'll put this up and then I'll go pull up the phone numbers I'm gonna do and you'll be able to hear voice calls through all this and we'll call the Netherlands and hope they're still up. Um, but I've, I've got a half a dozen of them around the world that we can go hit. But if you go to, and I'll use Cliffs because it's brighter again, if you scan this link, it will connect you to this Wi-Fi router. And then after you're connected, take the right one and that will load that mesh status page where you can start browsing. So. Um, let me go hook my phone up to it because I need to do the same thing. And I'll get my phone numbers real quick so that I can do a couple of phone calls up here because my phone switch is accessible. Um, I'm thinking it's about 3 or 4 a.m. in the Netherlands right now. Something like that. But if I have the, if I've got some extension numbers I can call and it'll read you the time and day of that site. All right, now, am I connected? I am connected, good. So now I'll do the other one, which is my browse page. All right. There we go. Now, like I said, feel free to browse around if you can. What I'm gonna do here doesn't have much to show. Um, but I don't wanna block the URLs for you guys to get around and uh, connect up if you can. Now keep in mind some of these connections are not high bandwidth, so you may not get fast response, but it will go through. And considering how many different nodes we're going through just to get to my house, let alone anywhere else on the mesh. All right, now, get me this node. There we go. And there's the web page. Now let's, oh, stop. All right. Now, slash demo.html. <laughs> there we go, all right. So one of the things that I put in on our phone switch is I can dial 73 in a call sign and it will give me their name and their extension number. Um, so let's put in Kyle, AA0Z. Whoops. A, A, zero, Z is at three, one, four, five, zero, zero, one. The person at extension. And his phone isn't set up, or he's not connected to it. But that way, if we set it up right, you can basically dial that from the phone switch and a call sign and just get straight to them. Um, you guys all have heard of WWV, right? Anybody here not know what WWV is? Okay, WWV is a transmitter at the uh, atomic clock out in Boulder. So I will preface this by saying this isn't the actual signal, but this is exactly what it sounds like. Second counts at <laughs> WW. 
Now, <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I had never listened to it that long. Oh, boy. Um, so this connection here, like I said, goes back to my house. That's the VPN connection back to New Jersey. So we're making all that connection back and forth, and the audio quality is pretty good. How about lag? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Appreciate that. I mean, I'll, I'll pay you for that one later. Right well, yeah. Um, what does it say at the tone the time is? <laughs> I don't know, but that would be funny. There's How many of you work on Unix? All right. You will appreciate this one. I'm not going to tell you what it is. First one to get it, tell me what it is. The time is one six five three seven zero three zero zero four. Goodbye. <laughs> You're right. Is it, is it NIST? No. It is actually the time. It told us the time. Is it the naval observatory? Or? No, it's uh, the Unix timestamp number, which is the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970, universal time. It's how it keeps track of time internally. And so somebody just said, and the number for that was 999-NERD. <laughs> um, let's go ahead and try Oregon. And we're going to get the local time back. May 27th, 2022 at 6.57 p.m. West Coast. Goodbye. Now, local. Friday, May 27th, 2022 at 8.58 p.m. Goodbye from... All right, um, Netherlands. I promised Netherlands. Let's see if they are up. Uh, 6392. That's promising. Saturday, May 28th, 2022 at 3.58 a.m. Boy, you had that time about right. New Zealand. I wonder if they're on. This is amazing. Last time I tried this, it didn't Saturday, work. Saturday, May 28th, 2022 at 1.58 p.m. <laughs> Goodbye. So what is it you're actually calling in each of these places? A phone switch. So it's just a software program called Asterisk, and they set up for phone extensions that basically uh, read back information like that. So when you dial a number, it gets the data from the key press from the phone, and then it decides where it's going to route it. It has an application inside it that basically will say, here's the time, and play these sounds and messages back based on this information. So it reads the time from the system and plays back the numbers of the audio recording to play it back. So all those different words are just separate audio files it plays back. So when you said at home, this is my you know, Arduino phone server, whatever a asterisk mm -hmm. hardware it was, um, you can run several different phones on your part of the net, and then it, it's linking out to the trunks. Mm -hmm. So this is a standard voice over IP. Absolutely, and in fact, this is a $25 phone I bought. Uh, the Cisco 500 series, uh, the SPA 500 series, um, they're really easy to program. I'm working on a provisioning system that you basically put it on, give it a static IP and a host name on your network, and basically you'll log into a page. Here's my call sign. 
hmm, I don't have you, I need a password. You give it a password and then um, what's your host name? It'll go find the model number from this, generate the extension for you, plug it into the configuration, blast that configuration, rewriting the phone's configuration because by usually it's a blank phone at that point, and then it just automatically comes up. So if you take a look at the front of the phone here, I've got a yellow button, which is not authenticated, and the green ones are. So the green button just means it is logged in and it's, it's ready for use. So literally, I just plugged it in after I did the configuration file, and it downloaded it and did all that stuff automatically. And this is working off of your server at home? Yes. It's, it's called Mesh Chat, or I'm sorry, Mesh Phone. Sorry, everybody's meshed something or other and it, I'm starting to get them all wrapped around in my head. Uh, but Mesh Phone is a seven digit dialing which gets you around. So all of these different meshes work. I have a neighbor on the phone switch that routes all traffic except for Kansas City and us back to New Jersey. New Jersey has us partitioned off from California, Oregon, those other meshes that I showed you those are actually connected back to him, but from other sections. And so we're segmented off so it doesn't overwhelm our routing tables. But the phone system, if I dial the right extension, seven, eight, and then I give it a seven digit dial, I get through New Jersey and he routes it back through. So that's my trunk well, to get to the rest. The, the, the fellow in New Jersey's the, the uh the big uh, long distance uh, uh, prefix moderator. If you will. More or less, yeah. And the nice thing is they've got a config file that we just pull that down every once in a while, change a couple of things specifically, uh, and then basically reload asterisk and boom, now we've added whoever else is on there. And so, uh, Hamshack Hotline, if you've heard of that. They also use phones like this. There is a way, and I haven't done this yet, to trunk from this same phone switch out to their network going through an internet connection. So that's something I'm gonna work towards when I get my overwhelming free time. Uh, so that way, you know, you'd be able to dial, you know, something else and get out to Hamshack Hotline. So I know I've done a lot of talking in the last little bit. I've thrown a whole bunch of information at you. Um, how many of you from this think that Arden would be something you would like to play with? So this router that I'm holding right here, 49 bucks on Amazon. That's all you need in order to get involved and connected. Um, you can plug, you can have, it has a Wi-Fi on it so your phone can connect to it. You can plug a laptop or a computer right in on it. I do something at home called putting a proxy server in there, which means from my home network, I talk anything that I don't know into the mesh and then it talks out and returns it back so I don't have to keep moving my connection back and forth. Yes? So you're talking way above me, but you say router, mm -hmm. we have a router this is a different kind of router. That's what I wanted to hear you say, right. It is the same kind of physical router, but this one has a particular chipset that they can program and download a firmware image to replace the operating system on that router. The routers that you normally get for the internet are very limited in what they let you do. This one, they put the Arden software and all of the control stuff that they do on it. And Correct me if I'm wrong, but that originated because the original router manufacturer used a Linux-based uh, software and they had to open it up. Basically, they had to supply the uh, source code to let, you, let the amateur groups do what they wanted with it. Other than they may not give you the driver. If they're using a standard chip, it works, and that's part of why Arden can say, yeah, we work on all this hardware because this is a standard chip that we can control. Now, where I was talking about some of these, they're doing some slightly different hardware designs now that the drivers and stuff in the image don't work right and they haven't gotten all that figured out yet. So that's why the suggested hardware list is what it is. So that way you can get something and have a high degree of confidence that the hardware and the software will work together. Then you have to worry about, do I have the ability to do a radio frequency link? 
my problem is I'm at the bottom of a well for my location. Mm -hmm. But a VPN will work for you until such time as... I move. <laughs> yep. Now, I'm sorry? Uh, I was going to say, everything you've seen tonight right now is still going over the internet because we don't have an RF link here. We're literally going from Mark's phone to Mark's router to node one over here, going to node two over there, going to my Wi-Fi router. Well, no, to my other router, to then go through your router. To my Wi-Fi hotspot, back to his house. Through the hospital's yeah, Wi-Fi. And the hotspot is because the hospital blocks everything. We had the same problem when we tried to do the video. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's all bouncing through my phone to his house, from his house, through the various mess services he has running. I mean, that's a lot of hops, but it's it's it works pretty well. I mean, audio quality on those phone calls, when I demonstrated this out in St. Charles Emergency Communication Association, it was glitchy as all get out. The uh, bandwidth that we had available and the latency was such that it just kept dropping packets. And so it sounded glitchy, like really annoying to listen to. This was outstanding call quality, especially for a bunch of radio links and bouncing all over the place just to get there. So yeah, if, if you go look at the uh, supported hardware matrix on the Arden website, oh, I'm sorry, I need to do this, a bit of housekeeping. I did promise links. All right, come on. Here are all those links that I promised so that you can uh, have them all in one spot. Uh, let me see if I can make this large. Sorry, I was going somewhere and I, I lost track trying to get that up. Um, oh, the, the matrix on this. This is the MikroTik, M-I-K-R-O-T-I-K, uh, HAP, H-A-P, light, L-I-T-E. You wanna make sure you get the light, but if you look on their supported matrix page, on there, it will have a link to Amazon that will take you to this specific model number. Use only the model number they give you because otherwise it has different hardware that may not work. This one has the five gigahertz, so your phone will connect, and two gigahertz, so if you have another one, they will mesh together. So those, uh, it's very specific to get that one model number and it has US in the uh, model, yep. So I think that's pretty much everything I had. Uh, if you wanna come up and take a look at some of the hardware as we're preparing to break it down, feel free. But other than that, thank you very much. I hope this has been interesting and informative. Oh yeah, uh, thank you. That was one of the things I wanted. I appreciate that. We set up an email, A-R-E-D-N, at slsrc.org. That will come to me, and if I need to, I can forward it to someone else, uh, depending on what you're looking for. But if you have questions and you don't want to join the Arden, uh, St. Louis Arden group, by all means, feel free to email, and uh, we'll do what we can to help you out, including, you know, if you need the links, stuff like that. Questions? No. Any questions for Mark? We have a raffle? Yes, we have a raffle. Uh, so you have oh. yeah. If you're in St. Louis, I mean St. Charles County, do you say you want to be in St. Louis County? It, it's just the messaging group, so you can ask your questions to either one. Okay. All, all we did is named it St. Louis Arden because it's the metro area, as opposed to KC or New York City or something like that. Other questions? So, info at SLS, SLSRC or Arden at SLSRC for information. Uh, then the SPL Arden 